Alan and Sean here from the Prancing Pony Podcast, welcoming you to the Tolkien Experience Podcast. The Tolkien Experience Podcast is an attempt to bring the fan and scholarly communities together around our shared passion, the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Each episode features a notable scholar or member of the fan community sharing their Tolkien experience. And now we'll send you over to Sarah and Luke. Thanks, Alan. I'm Sarah Brown. And I'm Luke Shelton. Every other week, we share with you an interview of a Tolkien scholar or fan. That's right. In these interviews, one of us asks our guest to respond to six questions that help us learn about their personal Tolkien experience. We are so excited to share this podcast with you. So without any more delay, let me introduce our guest. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Talking Experience podcast where I'm very excited to introduce you to none other than John Garth who is incredibly well known in our Tolkien world and we're delighted to have him on board for the uh, Talking Experience podcast today. So thank you ever so much for joining us John. Well thank you Sarah. No problem. Um, so as most people will be aware John is the author of Tolkien and the Great War and very exciting, the forthcoming Worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien book. Uh, he's won the Mythopaic Scholarship Award and the British Tolkien Society's Outstanding Contribution Award. His other writings include a short illustrated book, Tolkien at Exeter College, Chapters for the Blackwell Companion to J.R.R. Tolkien, Catherine McElwain's Bodleian Library Exhibition book, Tolkien Maker of Middle Earth, and so many articles in print and online that I'd be here for most of the interview reading them off. Um, now, among current projects is a further book on Tolkien's creative life in the context of his times, which I really want to hear a bit more about, uh, begun while a fellow of the Black Mountain Institute, Nevada. John read English at Oxford and worked for many years for the London Evening Standard newspaper. He also edits in print and online and regularly talks and teaches on Tolkien, including courses for Signum University, yay, Signum, and the Oxford University Department for Continuing Education. And of course, he is often to be seen at the Tolkien Society events uh, here in the UK, such as uh, Ox and Moot, but not alas in person this year, hey, John, because of good old COVID-19. That's right. It's scuppered rather a lot of plans hasn't it though? Are you going to do something online for that? Uh, not that I know of, but who knows? Okay, I think uh, I think they've sent out some invitations to offer some kind of online talk for, for people to do like a, a virtual Oxen Moot, which sounds quite interesting and better than nothing, I suppose. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, one, one thing I was looking forward to was the, the fact that it was going to take place at St Anne's College, Oxford, which is where I took my undergraduate degree. Um, and St Anne's has a connection with uh, Tolkienian history mm -hmm. uh, because it, it, it was based on the uh, Society for Home Students, uh, a women's college that was not a college, strictly, strictly speaking, no physical um, uh, building existed at that time um, and members of that college were instrumental in bringing The Hobbit uh, to publication and therefore Tolkien to the rest of us. Oh well hopefully hopefully we'll be back at St Anne's then maybe next year that would be good. I know St Anne's very well actually because um, I've stayed in St Anne's on a number of occasions uh, working for Oxford study courses and uh, next door in St Anthony's as well but uh, I was looking forward to it, but yeah, next year. Okay, so let's get cracking with our first question. And I'm going to ask you the usual introductory question. How, John, were you introduced to Tolkien's work? Well, I, it, it's slightly complicated. I, I was kind of introduced by C.S. Lewis uh, um, and then by uh, Alan Garner, um, who's, who's perhaps not so well known to some uh, international readers, um, but another major figure in, in British uh, fantasy uh, writing of the, uh, of the 1960s he started out. Um, so a, a school teacher, uh, plucked me out of my happy childhood reading comics by reading uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and Prince Caspian to our class when I was seven. Uh, and I was just overwhelmed. Um, I, I, I adored these stories. It was, it was just a, a marvel. Um, 
and I can remember sitting there, the, 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 cross-legged on the on the carpet, uh, weeping. I don't know if anyone else around me was, was weeping um, uh, over over the return of Aslan. Um, <laughs> uh, just finding it phenomenal, um, and and then just whipping through these books, the rest of the books myself, and that led me into being a really voracious reader, um, <clears throat> so that. Uh, by eight, um, I, I guess, or by, certainly by nine, I was reading Alan Garner, The Weird Stone of Brisingerman, which is a kind of... Um, the, Garner's gone on to be a really fascinating writer, um, very much in his own vein. Uh, but this is him finding his voice by kind of adapting a Tolkienian template um, of uh, an adventure of ordinary mm-hmm. people, in, in this case kids, um, uh, in a marvellous haunted landscape, in this case Cheshire in England, um, against the powers of darkness. Um, and the the the, th- the things that these books had in common, apart from the the the, the good and the evil element, the, the fantastical, uh, was the maps. Um, so, at some point, my uncle uh, recommended the Lord of the Rings to my mother, who bought a copy from her book club, a book club associates edition, and it was a beautiful uh, single volume hardback with a cover illustration by Pauline Baines, um, Mm. which will be familiar to many, I'm sure. Uh, And it just looks like a gateway because she she paints the the, uh, a landscape between the uh, arching branches of two trees. Um, And in in the roots of these two trees are all kinds of strange creatures lurking in the darkness. Um, and you see a, shire, a, a view across the Shire towards the Grey Havens with the, um, a, a troop of figures in it, including obviously Gandalf and various others. So I suppose it's supposed to be a scene from the final chapter of the book. Um, and I would open this at the age of eight and uh, just just drool over it um, uh, and think, I want to go to this place. I know I want to go to this place, though it's terribly daunting. I've never seen such a large book. Um, and, and the maps fascinated me. I can, I can just about, if I, if I kind of go into a, a, a Zen moment, uh, bring back the, it's almost a, like a physical feeling uh, or a, 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 a scent um, of, what it felt like to not know what all these names meant and what all these places were the mystery of it the uh, the the yeah, the uh, i don't know the, the the enticing wonder of it mm. so um and then came the turning point and i and I, th- this has fascinated me so much and i couldn't quite believe that it happened before i was 10 um uh or indeed before I was, I don't know, 12. Um, but uh, I was just short of 10, and it was the 29th of March, 1976, um, when I, I picked it up and started reading it. Um, and I know this because I remember I was killing time um, before the BBC screening of uh, Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. Mm. Um, I was a bit of a. I was, I was keen on learning about horror films when I was when I was that age, and uh, here was one that I was very excited about. So, I started reading. Um, I, I I did watch the film, so I obviously wasn't so gripped that <laughs> that, that, that I, I I thought, well, never mind Hitchcock. But um, I yes, yeah, so I, I then I made it through the whole book. Um, uh, and I, I remember very little about that first reading, um, just a, f- a few very strong impressions, uh, which I'll come to. Um, I do remember at some point cheating. So I, I, I did what I was a habit of mine at the time. I read the last sentence of the book. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, right. Um, and I also, even worse, um, and I suppose I was still perhaps in book two, I looked at the end of the chapter Mount Doom. 
Oh, you did and, not. And I kind of regret that. I still regret that. Um, and I, I will I'll go to my grave regretting that, I think. Uh, and I kind of wish that I could go back and just read it again for the first time, you know, um, because those those moments are, are just um, marvellous, you know. Um, and that was it. And I guess uh, then, then I must have read it pretty much straight away again because there was just so much to digest. And I was little, you know, um, mm. almost as small as the book. Um uh, and I, I know I'd read it, I don't know, seven times by the time I was in my early teens. Um, and it just went on from there. So uh, this was 1976, uh, as I said, and it was well-timed because uh, unlike people who uh, read The Lord of the Rings when it first came out, um, I only had a year to wait, a year and a bit, before The Silmarillion appeared. Mm. Um, so I read, I, I got that the day it came out um, uh, and... and uh, managed to make it through that too um i found it very difficult um very much not hitting the sweet spot that the lord of the rings had hit but hitting something else that was fascinating um and uh, and then i think i think i read the hobbit after that and and i was disappointed um because it didn't deliver um although it delivered hobbits it didn't deliver um, and anything on the on the epic scale that, that I wanted, um, and I've, I suppose I've grown to like the Hobbit more um, over the years since. But Lord of the Rings would still be my desert island book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't believe you remember the day that you first read it. That's astonishing. Well, I, I had to I had to check this. There's a wonderful uh, BBC website uh, where called Genome, where you can go in and, and do searches on the uh, content of the Radio Times um, magazine that used to list all the, t the television. Um, so that's that's how I checked the date. Yeah. <laughs> that's incredible. Goodness me. Um, and yet the Silmarillion is a bit of a shock after the Lord of the Rings, I know, um, because I remember the same sort of sensation myself when I picked it up because um, I took the same, exactly the same edition uh, off my father's shelf when I was about that same age, about eight o'clock and uh, eight o'clock, eight years old. <laughs> oh, goodness. I know it's been a long day, about eight years old, and I devoured it. Um, and then he handed me the Silmarillion and I thought, oh, more. And yes, it, I actually, um, it defeated me on first reading and I had to return to it a little while later. Um, it didn't, it didn't defeat me, but I do remember, um, that still by the time I was what, 13, 14, um, I remember a friend of mine uh, who had managed to ab absorb it, um, better than I had teasing me because I couldn't remember who was Fingon and who was Fingolfin and, you know, oh, goodness <laughs> That kind of thing. <laughs> of all the things to be, but uh, but uh, but I I I was deeply affected by it. So so what um, what disappointed me about it actually was that it didn't have the extended um, poetry in it. Uh -huh. It didn't have the lays of Beleriand in, within it um, because I'd read about these and I was quite for some reason or other as a as a as a ten year old I was quite uh, excited. Uh, the prospect of them. I'd read about them in Humphrey Carpenter's biography of Tolkien, um, which mm -hmm. was also my first taste of biography. And then uh, one final one final little detail is that at the age of 12, I um, won a fiction contest at my little middle school um, by writing what could only be described as a a rip off of the Silmarillion, where I, <laughs> where I had invented a, a, a race much like the elves um, and a, a, an order of, of angelic beings, much like the Valar, um, mm -hmm. and a, a creator much like Iluvatar, um, and given them all uh, names in a language that I'd invented. Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, at the, at the very beginning, it's extraordinarily um, like the Silmarillion. <laughs> brilliant you were writing fan fiction right <laughs> fantastic so i hand you all of tolkien's works what's your favorite bit to read or has that changed over time oh it, it, it changes every time i look at his writing mm. um so 
to go back to the beginning, and I mentioned this earlier, there were some some points that I remember from my first reading, and I and I think the very first uh, thing that that really struck me um, was at the house of Tom Bombadil, and mm-hmm. and I never understand why people don't like this sequence. Um, because for me, this was when, never mind uh, the shadow of the past, this was when I first started to feel this immense sense of depth. Um, and it, it, I think it was a feeling I'd never experienced before, you know. Um, but it's when Bombadil is describing the, the wars between the little kings of little kingdoms, and he doesn't give them names. Um, and, and it's this this scene on the downs, and you know, it, it, it was just hugely evocative um, of something I, that was just beyond grasp. Um, so that that was a that was a wonder. Um, I, uh, of course. Uh, loved and still do love those moments of, of what Tolkien calls you catastrophe mm-hmm. where, um, uh, particularly you know the horns of the Rohirrim uh, oh, yes. <laughs> outside Minas Tirith and um, Eowyn unveiling herself uh, in front of the witch king um, to, to get his comeuppance um, so <sighs> Yeah, I've actually read The Lord of the Rings aloud before um, to a very long-suffering and patient listener. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> every time one of these scenes would come up, uh, I, I would just go to pieces. It was impossible, so I, I must have spoiled them all. <laughs> um, as, as time goes by, I find more and more of the book intensely moving. Um, so one of the one of the little bits that struck me um, on a on a relatively recent reading, or rather a, a, a dipping, um, and so, so I haven't actually read the whole book straight through for quite quite some time. Um, I, I, I tend to dive in um, for for research purposes more more often than I read it. But one of the scenes that really struck me was um, Sam uh, saying very very early on, um, if those. Black riders come near us. They're going to have Sam Gamgee to reckon with, and I just think, you know, I don't know if Tolkien ha- had in mind what was what Sam was going to achieve, but he does achieve their destruction, you know, mm. uh, along with everything they stand for, um, and, and I think that's that's marvelous. It, it, it is marvelous, and it, it's just one of those things. It, it, it's such a, a closely written book. Um, pregnant with implications, uh, th- and that's why it bears rereading, um, re-examining, and re-experiencing. Mm. Um, another another one is is um, uh, Frodo at Karen Amroth, um, uh, feeling as though he's looking into the elder days. Um, but yeah, there's so many. Yes, I agree. Um, I haven't read the physical book now in a in a oh it must be a couple of years but i have fairly recently re-listened to rob inglis's recording uh and i I get to the bit of the death of theoden and i just completely lost it so i'm wandering around the house with my earbuds in listening to the death of theoden and tears streaming down my face feeling utterly pathetic and everybody in my family's looking at me like are you crazy um but yeah there are moments that just it doesn't matter how many times you read them, they still just get you. And that's, that's one of them for me, that's for sure. I think, I think, I think Theoden's funeral was actually the first time I cried while reading a book. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have a favourite part of the Silmarillion? Uh, well, it used to be um, uh, Turin Tarambar. I mean, the... the, the... The encounter with the, the death of Glaurung, I suppose, um, and the, the miserable stuff that happens straight afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it is unrelenting misery in places, isn't it? <laughs> um, and and uh, you know, I was when I was much younger, I was a real sucker for the the, the kind of cold eyed uh, heroism on the verge of despair, where where. Hurin's hewing off the arms of orcs seventy times. He cried, you know, um, that that bit. Um, let me think. Uh, since then, yeah, I think maybe the 
the uh, the birth of the two trees I found particularly wonderful, um, and it, it hurts me to think that Tolkien ever thought of uprooting that aspect of his myth, the idea that the two trees um, bore the fruit that became the sun of the sun and the moon. Um, so, so you know, late in life, he he started making revisions where the sun and the moon were <clears throat> um, predated the um, the the creation of the two trees um the climax of the akalabeth i find immensely powerful and moving um yeah i do think that the somerleon um wonderful as it is and uh, uh, as an amazing an achievement as it is editorially um lacks something that you gain by reading at Tolkien's various attempts to write it, his fragmentary attempts to write it. So it lacks, for example, a certain ebullience that comes with the Book of Lost Tales. Um, and, and there are well, not just ebullience, but, but um, a, a certain raw, uh, rawness. Um, so that it's really well worth reading uh, not only The Fall of Gondolin, uh, which has been published uh, it, in, in the recent Christopher Tolkien's most recent book, mm-hmm. um, but also the story of the original version of the story of Turin Tarambar um, uh, is is extraordinarily powerful, um, and I think um, pretty plainly that this is Tolkien working through, or partly working through, um, the trauma of the the First World War. Mm. Um, which it bears on very closely in certain ways because it's about trauma. Um, and then, then another aspect um, of Tolkien, which, which has been immensely important for me um, and goes th- through all of his Middle Earth works, is the invented languages. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. So that caught me very early. Uh, the, 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 the names, when I saw them on the maps, struck me as extraordinarily beautiful. And I became fascinated when I started to notice that, um, you know, there were patterns in these names. So, you know, the mountain ranges had the word Ered in them um, and, and so on. And, I, and I, I started to make word lists, name lists, started to analyze the names. Uh, probably still got my notes from when I was very young. I learned to type by typing these things up to attempt to make a dictionary. And over the years, when the um, History of Middle Earth volumes were being published, I've, I've got to confess, uh, I'm slightly ashamed of this, but my primary motive for uh, reading them, my initial motive, was, was more language. Um, so I, I would race through them um, and uh, probably miss a great deal of their literary qualities and, and a, a great deal of Christopher Tolkien's um, meticulous uh, work describing the evolution of the stories, because I, I'd just be looking out for the next the next bit of Quenya, <laughs> the next bit of Cinderin, mm-hmm. um, and that is actually what led me uh, by a circuitous route to writing my first book, Tolkien and the Great War. Oh, how did it lead into that? Well, when the history of Middle Earth sequence was finally published in its entirety with uh, volume 12, The Peoples of Middle-earth. I think this was 96. Um, I felt really quite bereaved um, and I decided that it was time to revisit them all. And still my primary uh, ladder through these books was the language. I decided it was time that I made the ultimate Elvish dictionary. Um, uh, but as Christopher has shown, Tolkien's creativity, creativity never stood still. And it was as true with his invented languages as it was with his stories. So it would be impossible to make a dictionary in the sense uh, that we use an English dictionary. Um, Tolkien uh, had invented histories for these languages. Um, but he'd also kept changing not only the languages, but also those histories themselves. So it would have to be a kind of a stratified dictionary where you could um, 
you could see what the elvish vocabulary was, what the state of Quenya was at any given point in Tolkien's creative life. Um, and to do that, you would have to, first of all, try to establish a, a reliable chronology of composition um, for all the, all the texts that contain these words. So I, I sat down to do this and I labored over a database uh, for a, a couple of years. Um, and uh, very tedious it was too. Um, I learned a lot about databases, which I've never used since. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it also uh, gave me great pleasure because I did reread very carefully the history of Middle Earth. And while I was rereading the Book of Lost Tales and making notes about the dates of Tolkien's early poetry, um, I noticed, of course, that some of this poetry was written in army training camps during the First World War. Mm -hmm. uh, at this very same time, I was uh, reading some fiction set in the First World War. So uh, a couple of great books, um, uh, Birdsong by oh, Sebastian yeah. Falks, Excellent. which uh, is partly set um, during the Battle of the Somme, close to the point where Tolkien's great friend, Geoffrey Bates Smith, was stationed on the first day of the Somme. Um, and Pat Barker's Regeneration, oh, which is... Yeah, Fo yeah, focuses on 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 two other war writers, uh, most unlike Tolkien, um, but very very famous in their own right, Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon. And my thought was, so why is it that these men, who experienced what Tolkien experienced, wrote what we consider as being canonical um, war literature? And Tolkien uh, started, he, he didn't continue, he started writing his stories about elves. He started writing fairy stories, The Lost Tales. Um, yeah, he'd begun uh, a couple of years earlier uh, writing poems, writing um, uh, his lexicon of Quenya, which, which is a bit like a writer's notebook with, with ideas for plots in it. Um, but you might have thought that the experience of battle itself would have shaken all that nonsense out of him. But no, um, it, it um, I think, quite clearly showed to him that it wasn't nonsense at all, that it was uh, something that he could use. Um, uh, he could combine with whatever, whatever energies, uh, anxieties um, he had acquired during the Somme. Um, and, and together, all of these things will work. Um, as the engine of story. So I started researching what Tolkien did in the war. Um, and still at this point, my main aim was to get the chronology of his movements straight. Um, there was a, a wonderful moment when I was watching the news, and I think it was December of 97. Um, and I saw that for the first time since the end of the First World War, um, officers' service records, uh, British Army officers' military service records were going to be opened uh, to public readers at the uh, National Archive in Kew. Um, so I was there the day those papers were opened up and I got Tolkien's out and looked through it. And that, and that was, that was a, a great boon. Um, so uh, yeah, it went on from there. And uh, my my article, which I, I I I had an idea of getting it published in a fanzine, <laughs> turned into turned into forty four thousand words in three months, um, and uh, and then sat for a couple of years actually um, while I gathered more information, um, and eventually pitched it to Harper Collins when shortly after. Um, uh, Peter Jackson's movie franchise had been announced, the Lord Good of the Rings timing. movies. And HarperCollins, at that point, it was, it was kind of golden for me because they were looking for something to publish uh, that was not a movie tie-in, something to vary their output during those years, something that was uh, a, a 
a bit more intelligent, um, if you like, um, mm -hmm. a bit more uh, analytical. Um, and there I was. Um, and so it, it evolved from there and it changed greatly once I had um, a contract from them because uh, A, I started to um, get a little bit of assistance from the Tolkien estate, which eventually led to me seeing his military papers and the letters of the uh, TCBS, uh, Smith, who I mentioned earlier, Christopher Wiseman, Rob Gilson and Tolkien. Um, so I was saying, yes, it changed, uh, the, the book changed drastically from that first draft. Uh, the, the B uh, aspect of that was because I was absolutely terrified uh, once I had got a publisher's contract. Um, I was terrified. I had a kind of stage fright um, and I knew I would have to work incredibly hard to bring the book up to the kind of standard that I would like to read myself. Um, and the standards I was thinking of were Tom Shippey, mm -hmm. um, who wrote to Middle Earth, uh, was a, a huge influence on me um, in showing me why Tolkien mattered as literature. Um, and Verlin Flieger's A Question of Time, um, mm. which explores Tolkien and, and everything he does with, with time, time slips. And, uh, time standing still in Lothlorien and so on. And they're both hugely intelligent um, but accessible books. So that was that was the standard I was aiming for. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know if I achieved it, but it, I certainly worked extremely hard to get there. Oh, I think you achieved it. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those books that um, anybody who wants to know anything about Tolkien and the Great War, there, there are two people I instantly go to. One, one is you and the other one is Janet Brennan Croft. Um, so yes, I would say it is. Uh, in fact, my first experience was of the audio book um, because I was ex extraordinarily busy at the time your book was published. And I decided to get the audio book, which I had more time to listen to for various reasons. Uh, and I enjoyed listening to the audio book so much. I just ordered the, the uh, physical copy as well. Um, but the audiobook was wonderful too. Uh, let, oh, me thank ask, you. let me ask you a question, actually, as we're talking very much about Tolkien bio, what did you think of the recent uh, film, Tolkien? I thought it was very beautiful to look at, um, very nicely acted. Um, aspects of the script were, were interesting. Um, I, I quite liked the character, the fictional character, Edith. Um, but you know, I did, I did, it was so much fiction. Um, and, and I felt, um, I felt it was a missed opportunity, um, to, to tell a story that hewed more closely to the facts. Mm. Um, I, I don't think it would have lost anything by doing that. I think it could have gained a great deal. Um, I understand arguments about, you know, the need to compress, the need to streamline. Um, but it seems to me that a great deal was changed there. Not for those reasons, but out of um, uh, what I think is a not terribly brave um, conviction that a book, uh, um, sorry, a, a movie will only succeed if it hits the right Hollywood dot to dot numbers. Uh huh. So I felt as though they'd taken the facts, uh, taken quite a lot of the facts and, you know, a lot of interesting detail, um, but put it into a, a, a mixing bowl, uh, liquefied it, and then poured it into these pre-existing uh, movie makers' moulds. Um, and, yeah, I just felt as though they couldn't quite look look past those things. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So there we are. Um, a, sh a shame. But having said that, you know, there are people who love Tolkien who also really like those films, that film, I should say. Um, and, and I kind of had similar problems with the Lord of the Rings movies, actually, um, yeah. where I would be watching uh, and admiring the, the, the costumes and the landscapes and then <laughs> thinking, no, no, that doesn't happen, you know. <laughs> Skateboarding elves, for one thing. Yeah, dwarf tossing, um, yeah. you know, all, all sorts of things. And, and of course, the, the Hobbit movies, even more so. Oh, don't even. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, like you, I, I enjoyed the uh, Tolkien biopic as a film. And there were some uh, beautiful moments and I quite enjoyed what they did with the battlefield uh, and the imagery around the battlefields. But they did play with time quite a lot and uh, they uh, they certainly played around with the facts quite a lot. But uh, yeah, beautifully acted and some very nice things to watch other than you that. I have to say my major criticism actually is, and this all comes from having written Tolkien in the Great War um, and, and trying to map out chronology. So that, yeah, that annoyed me, of course, any, any messing with chronology. Yeah. Uh, but but it, it was the fact that the film actually reversed what the impact of the Somme was on Tolkien. Yeah. It, it, it said that it gave Tolkien writer's block that lasted for years, when, well, when in well, fact that. it unleashed the stories immediately. Yeah, it's a kind, of, kind of a strange inversion, as you say, as a sort of a strange decision to make. I, I, think, it, I think it came again from a, a failure of courage, which is, you know, it's difficult um, to explain to an audience that doesn't already know quite a bit about Tolkien that there was a long gap between his war experiences and The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Um, but surely it wouldn't have been impossible uh, to explain that he began building a mythology at that time and mm. only came to The Hobbit later. Yeah, perhaps they thought it would just take too much explanation for the the moviegoers who, who don't know Tolkien as well as some of us do, but yeah. Um, okay, so moving on from that, because all of this is really fascinating, and frankly, I could sit here all night and chat about it. Um, obviously, with the ways in which you've written about Tolkien and you've talked about him in public on large numbers of occasions and written papers, etc., cetera, um, do you have a fondest experience of working with Tolkien stuff? Um, yes, so were well, several really. Um, one was the day that I remembered, uh, this is bearing in mind that I was an undergraduate at Oxford University in the mid 1980s. Um, and in the late 90s, I suddenly remembered that I had a perpetual membership of the Bodleian Library which meant that I could go in and look at the unrestricted um, Tolkien manuscripts there. So, so by unrestricted, I mean I couldn't go in and look at his at Silmarillion papers, um, but I could go and look at his academic papers, and uh, uh, you know, among them there might be some gems. Um, so, I the very next day I got on the coach from London, went to Oxford, and got through the door and was looking at Tolkien's manuscripts that very afternoon and the, the catalogue which had been put together by um, the uh, librarian um, uh, and archivist Judith Priestman um, highlighted various points where Elvish appeared in his uh, unrestricted papers. So I, I went through looking at all of these things and that was, that was just a sheer joy um, to be handling Tolkien's own manuscripts, seeing his own <laughs> handwriting. Um, and that, that's happened uh, quite a few times since. Um, and uh, that's been, yeah, that's been wonderful. Um, other ones. Oh, I once went and disturbed uh, Priscilla Tolkien uh, without warning um, at the age of 12 by knocking on her door and asking if she would sign um, uh, the wow. Father Christmas letters for me. Um, and she scolded me because I'd interrupted a piano lesson uh, she was giving, uh, but she very graciously did sign it. Um, and, and that was that was quite a. Ne never mind the fact that it was unwelcome, <laughs> and I'm sorry, Priscilla. Uh, <laughs> but it was a major feat for me because I was the shyest twelve year old you can imagine. Um, so, oh, oh, and that brings me to another great pleasure, actually, which has been an abiding one. Um, so the whole thing has brought me out of my shell, um, primarily uh, because having spent, you know, five years researching and writing a book, I 
really felt that I wanted to talk to people about it and, and, and persuade them to read it and to listen to my ideas. So I had to learn to stand up in front of an audience and talk without going to pieces. Um, and now I really enjoy uh, enjoy that experience. That, I mean, the talking, not the going to pieces, because I don't really do that anymore, which is a great relief. Just as well with the number of um, times you do have to speak in public. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I kind of cheat mostly because I, I tend to read pre-prepared papers, but I but I also enjoy the Q and A's where I have to freewheel it. Yeah. Um, what else? I, I really thoroughly, um, very, very special to me has been um, my correspondence with Christopher Tolkien. Um, uh, may he rest in peace. Um, uh, and and that began um, during the writing of uh, Tolkien and the Great War, when things were things were getting really quite difficult with the book um and and christopher sort of reached out and rescued a, a tricky situation um and and we communicated by fax from then on um and he was great uh, you know he was he was helpful he was witty he was uh <laughs> rude and abrasive um uh, by fax this was you know um but but i I respected all of that, really, um, and I think what what helped me was that I was at that time and had been for, for years working for the London Evening Standard in the newsroom as a sub editor, and nothing that Christopher Tolkien ever said to me by fax could compare with the uh, rudeness and abrasiveness of my um, uh, <laughs> superiors at the Standard. That built a thick skin for you. <laughs> absolutely yeah so let's talk about the new book i really want to talk about the new book um your approach to the first book i presume was a little different to the way in which you've approached this new one well no <laughs> not not really because i've approached this new one in a, in a very oblique way um it spun off from the other book that has been mentioned on which I'm working, which is has the working title Tolkien's Mirror, um, that is a study of Tolkien's creative writings as a response to the crises of his times. So that's and a very... I want to hear more about that in a minute, that's for sure. Yeah, okay. That, but that's, that, that's obviously a very logical extension of um, Tolkien and the Great War uh, and involves a great deal of investigation into chronology. Um, and along the way, I um, started finding out a great deal of really fascinating information about uh, Tolkien's trip to Cornwall um, in 1914. Um, well, let's just take that as an example. Oh, oh uh, I had ideas about the old forest um, and inspirations for that, um, all tied to looking closely at what was going on in Tolkien's life, uh, either when he was writing these things or shortly before. Um, and during this work, which was just ballooning out of all proportion, as anything does if you don't have a publisher's deadline, um, and if you, your, your idea of the structure is uh, not firmly nailed down. Um, while this was going on, uh, a former colleague of mine from the Evening Standard um, said to me, I think that you should come to my publisher she she writes her name is victoria summerley and she writes books about english gardens um for a publisher called francis lincoln which is a division of quarto books and they publish really beautiful coffee table books you know books for browsing books for for for, for, for looking at as well as reading um she said i think that they would really like a book about tolkien and his English inspirations, his landscapes, you know. So uh, she uh, she engineered a meeting uh, for me, um, and I brainstormed some thoughts, came up with a structure, went along, um, and he seemed, yeah, quite uh, excited by the idea. Um, lots of lots of thoughts were mooted on illustration, um, which didn't 
didn't happen. There was talk of uh, commissioning Alan Lee to do Ooh. one uh, key piece of artwork for each chapter. Um, and and that's my, I think my one regret about this book is that we, we Alan was, I, I asked him uh, myself as well. So he's been asked repeatedly <laughs> if he would do this, <laughs> but he's always been too busy, you know. Um, yeah. he, he, he said he would really love to have uh, had the opportunity to go out and do some some real landscapes um, uh, around Britain, but uh, you know he's always he was always being given jobs by Christopher Tolkien. I think <laughs> I think that was the problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, it all came out of that. Um, so chronology was in there. Now, when I finally came down to writing the book, which I, I only began properly once. Um, I, I had a, a contract from Quarto, um, and that was a long time past before that was finally achieved. Um, I, first of all, I, I had a short period of panic, rather like I had with uh, Tolkien in the Great War, um, realising in this instance that Whereas with Tolkien and the Great War, not many people at that time had written very much about it. Um, an awful lot of people have written loads of stuff about Tolkien's uh, inspirations from places um, and also from different world cultures, which is something that I really thought was important to tackle. Um, so I spent a few weeks just uh, diving into other people's writings and gathering uh, information and perspectives that way. And then hammering out a structure so I didn't make the same, same mistake I was going to make with, um, I was making with, with Tolkien's Mirror, um, mm -hmm. so that I had a, 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 a good solid set of chapters to work to. Um, and then trying to wrangle all this information into the right chapters, that was, that was uh, hellish at times. Um, I, know, I know that sounds awfully, you know, not first world problems, um, <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but writing really is quite difficult, you know, because not only is it, 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 it can be very long hours. It can be very solitary. I mean, lockdown is is the writing life, frankly. Um, uh, but but at times you start to think, am I ever going to get there? You know, I may be fascinated by this, but but can I can I pull it all together? Can I tie all these things up properly? Um, can I chase these things down? Um, uh, yeah, but it it does eventually. Um, if you persist, it comes together and it has, and it's, it's very lovely. Mm -hmm. mm. So um, let's just for a moment, let, let, let me dive into this Tolkien's mirror. Um, when do we see this possibly making an appearance? I don't know. I still haven't approached <laughs> a publisher with it. So get on that. A third book <laughs> from you would be very good, please. Yes, please and thank you. I can hear people rubbing their hands on the other side of this broadcast. Um, so what's the central thesis for Tolkien's Mirror then? It's The thesis is that um, Tolkien's writings were at least partly um, a way of exorcising the nightmare of his times. Um, so I, I, I want to revisit his response to the First World War, uh, also to look at his response to uh, the Spanish Civil War and the Second World War, uh, which of course is a major, uh, a, a major topic really, because he denied so stringently um, uh, that he was um, influenced by the Second World War. Um, but this also involves quite a lot of development in, in between times. Uh, so there's, there's a lot there's a lot to say here um, that that hinges also partly on his religious faith um, and and the way that plays out in writings for the Silmarillion, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, thinking about things like his religious faith and then linking back to the fact that you've just done a book which is on his landscape inspirations and things like that, what does it add to our knowledge of, understanding of, working with Tolkien to have this background information? What do you think that gives us? Hey, I think partly it just satisfies um, something that Tolkien naturally encourages, which is a desire to learn more about the world in which we live. 
and its its history um, uh, to learn about it as a kind of touchstone for our experience our shared experiences these are these are the kinds of um, values that he impregnates in Lord of the Rings and everything else um, mm -hmm. he he knows how to make things matter and when you get up from those books and this is what I've always found you want to know more about your own world I mean you want to know about the stars you want to know about trees um, you want to know about geo topography geography and history um, so this this exercise exercises all of those urges in me um, as to what it brings to a reading of the book, I, I just think it shows how bound up with himself and his real experiences um, his creative writings were, uh, how close they were to his heart. And I think, mm -hmm. I think that comes, comes through quite well, I hope, in this book, because I've told parts of it as, as, a, as a story. And the unfolding of the story uh, of Tolkien's life and work um, in tandem with, the, in the context of the landscapes in which he lived, or the landscapes he read about, um, uh, is what really brings it all home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, when is um, the new book officially released, actually? On my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> of course, um, it's, it's, it's officially published on the 9th of June, although, and I think this is a result of the coronavirus situation, uh, where publishers and uh, booksellers simply don't want to, to keep things sitting idle in their warehouses. Um, it seems to be being shipped by everyone um, so by now. So uh, yeah, people are, people are, are getting it and, and tweeting about it, which is very lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, a complete contrast, incidentally, to uh, what happened with Tolkien in the Great War, which was which which came out before social media, but also before I had any kind of reputation. Um, so uh, there was very little feedback about Tolkien <laughs> in the Great War, except from a few people who very kindly uh, wrote me letters or emailed me. So thank you, John Garth, for that fascinating discussion. It was really interesting to hear all about your process for the two books. Um, and just to let everybody know that John will be teaching a course at Signum University this fall, uh, which will be all based off of this new book that is just about to be published. So do look into the course at Signum University if you want to learn a little bit more about John's work on this recent book. Mm. I, I the first time I ever spoke to you um, when I did actually talk to you about Tolkien the Great War and you probably don't remember this but it was back in that teeny tiny little Tolkien uh, conference in the middle of nowhere in Wales near Aberystwyth uh, in that village Pantred van der Guide. do you remember that? I, I certainly remember the situation I was frankly more um, uh, I, I was somewhat distracted that that weekend um, by the fact that my uh, wife and daughter were um, also with me, and my daughter was what was she? She was she was very little. She was two. I remember eating her. She was yeah. two, and it, it was or, or it, maybe she was not quite two. Um, no, she was two. Uh, but, but so it was a wonderful experience being there with her. It, it was a, a major adventure. Um, so a lot of that has has been wiped from my mind. I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> It was a yeah, it was an interesting uh, interesting weekend. That one. It was the academic part of it was very enjoyable. It was great. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a question that I ask at the end of of every one of these interviews, um, and it's kind of a strange question to ask, I suppose, when we're talking to people like you. You know, would you recommend Tolkien's work? Um, I suppose we could turn it into to whom would you recommend Tolkien's work? I'd recommend it to anyone, frankly. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know that uh, it's anathema to some people. Um, I, I wonder how hard they've tried. You know, I, I suspect that um, particularly before Peter Jackson's films came out, a, 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 an awful lot of people were deterred simply by um, the first chapter 
um, because mm-hmm. of its whimsy or apparent whimsy. Um, and then maybe by the second chapter because of its portentousness. Um, but I do think you've got to persist to really see uh, the, the beauty of it all. Um, and really, I really persist beyond Lord of the Rings because it's only by reading the Silmarillion that you, that you, that you really learn the, the, the depths of it all, the, um, the, the, mm. the full dimensions of it. Um, so, yes, I would, I'd recommend it to anyone wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, thank you very much for spending time with us today. I appreciate you doing that. It's been fantastic to talk to you. And you, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak and uh, at such length about myself and my obsessions. <laughs> I think you'll find that everybody on this particular podcast is obsessed with something to do with Tolkien. So that's perfectly fine. You're amongst friends here, I assure you. Hurrah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, John. We are so thankful that we have such gracious scholars and fans who want to share their Tolkien experience with us and with you. We have a lot of fun making these podcasts. So much fun. It's always exciting to talk to fans and scholars about their Tolkien experience. If you want to know more about the ways to connect with this episode's guest that they mentioned in this interview, we provide show notes at TolkienExperience.com. Also, don't forget to follow the podcast on your favourite social media sites. That's right. We're on Facebook as Tolkien Experience, and also on Twitter as at Tolkien EXP. So don't forget to like, follow, share, and comment, because we love interacting with you just as much as we enjoy talking with our guests. You can also follow our personal Twitter accounts. I am at Luke B. Shelton. You can also look for me on Twitter, where I am at Aaron L. Palmerdil. You can find the podcast on all major podcast services, including Apple, Stitcher, and YouTube. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We truly hope that, in a way, it contributes to your own Tolkien experience. <laughs>